Matt Nagler, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you, Howie. It's good to be here. Yeah, so you are, uh, I wrote this down, I'm going to say it right, a professor of economics at City College of New York and of the Graduate Center of City University, all, both in New York City. Yes. And we met in seventh grade, I believe. Yeah, it was a few years ago. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah, think we, it was. We I think won't date we, ourselves. Yeah, I was going to say, I, th yeah. I, I think we really kind of became friends in eighth grade. I think uh, it was it was kind of when Chris Klimowitz kind of uh, broke the ice for me, because I think you all kind of uh, viewed me as this uh, irreparable nerd because I hung out with some some unmentionables. And then I think in eighth grade, my I kind of um, Chris helped me rehabilitate my image. And, and then and then you guys were willing to be friends with me. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to let that pass, but I, that's not how I remember it at all. I, uh, I don't think I was, I, I was really like, you know, hanging out with the football team <laughs> myself. So uh, I'll, well, there's I'll, a story that we I'll won't see go your into nerd and, as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's leave all that in the past. Um, but, it's, you know, it's been a long time. And the, 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 the thing I remember about you uh, the most, first of all, that your writing was always so good um, that I was secretly jealous. And, and then I, I, I remember, like, you were the reason that I stopped believing in standardized testing because I remember you didn't do a great job on, like, SAT English, and you were, like, the best writer and reader I knew. And I was like, you just took a long time to think. And tests are bullshit. Yeah, I had kind of a big spread between my English score and my math score in the SAT, something on the order of like 200 points, which is crazy big. Um, well, the good news is that my English kind of came together a little bit later. And I've had like, I think when I took the GREs, I did much better. So, Yeah, but, you know, like that really that really liberated me from a lot of, of bad thinking about what scores meant. So I've always I've always appreciated you for for that lesson, even though you, you might not have wanted to uh, be the impetus. Yeah, no, I, you're very kind about well, my writing, by the way, Howie. I, I, I still remember what you wrote in my yearbook. You actually wrote in my yearbook about how how you, you, you consider to be a great writer, which I thought was really great praise coming from you, especially. And, and what I thought was really kind of neat about what you wrote in my yearbook is that you actually um, you put a footnote. You actually, with your you know handwriting with your pen and everything, you actually wrote a footnote in there, and you you attributed something to our teacher, Mister Lasco. I thought that was great that you actually had your citations all lined up properly. See, I missed my calling as an academic. <laughs> Yeah. No, that was that so was anyway, definitely so was speaking of <laughs> I do not I do not remember that, but I will <laughs> I will use that in my in my hand to to play the nerd card if you ever bring up that silly story again. <laughs> so anyway, about writing, we're 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 talking about um a a book that is that has been um, forming in your mind, and it's it's gotten to the point where you have a, an agent and um, some drafts of a proposal, and and you you sent me a uh, an early version of that that I and so well I'll take a look because Matt's a friend and that could be helpful. And like four pages in, I was like, holy shit, this changes the way I see everything. And so I wanted to talk to you about that. So can you? Uh, first of all, like I just said, you're a professor of economics, but kind of give us a little sort of, um, you know, biographical background, like what what brought you into that and what what kind of interests you about economics? Yeah, it's been kind of a crazy ride uh, because I um, I actually, for some reason, had the idea to get a Ph.D. in economics right out of college, uh, probably because my advisor kind of talked me into that, my uh, major advisor. But um but I was very young when I started the program. I was just, I was 21 when I graduated and went right into that program. And then, uh, of course, when I finished the PhD, I was still so young, I really had no idea what I wanted to do with it. And, um, and so there ensued over the next 10 years, a very um, almost random set of, 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 of kind of wanderings. I, well, I mean, I first 
took a job uh, in antitrust consulting right out of graduate school, which it was it's for some people. I think that consulting is the right move for some people, but it was not the right move for me. I was not good at it and I didn't like it at all. And I did that. I so I did it for a full three years. Well, what, and then what, what's what's. What's antitrust consulting? Who, who are yeah. you working for? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so antitrust, as you may know, is sort of, it's sort of the area of the law that relates to competition. So I was an expert in competition from economics, the area of economics called industrial organization. And so, and so there's all the, there's this whole body of law relating to it, basically relating to mergers and sort of what mergers can be allowed or not allowed. And, and the rules under which, you know, what market share is, 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 is a reasonable market share for a company to have and what's too much and what's monopolization. All of those concepts are all collectively what we call antitrust. So antitrust consulting is sort of where uh, economists like me, you know, young, recently granted PhD economists and, and you know, uh, work basically uh, either as expert witnesses or to, to write expert reports for more senior expert witnesses. Um, for antitrust litigation. So it's a kind of what you're doing is you're kind of like using economics to kind of come up with, you know, stories that can make a case for one side or another. And uh, so and, would, and, would you have would you have been hired by some cable company that didn't want Comcast to buy some you know, some other company? Yeah, yeah, you might right. Well, I mean, so mergers could be opposed by it could be opposed by a company like that could bring a case, or uh, very often mergers are also opposed by uh, by uh, regulatory authorities, the the ones that have authority over deciding whether a merger is acceptable, the Department of Justice, Federal Commu uh, Federal Trade Commission, <clears throat> and so forth. But I actually. I worked on maybe one or two mergers when I was in consulting. Mostly I was working on like monopoly cases. I worked on a, a price fixing case. Um, and usually I was, my firm was being hired by defendants. So I was in a position of preparing an expert witness who was defending a monopoly or defending somebody who had done some kind of a bad act, as we say. Uh -huh. And uh, so gotcha. that was the job. And so you really uh, were a... You really were a protest, pro, pro trust consultant. Yeah, that's right. In the world of antitrust, I was a pro trust consultant. That's right. Yeah. So, and okay. I'd say, I don't know, what about it wasn't it for me? The thing is, I kind of didn't really necessarily realize at the time, but what I kind of got into into graduate school for and, and the whole academic track was I was just naturally you know, curious. And I, I like challenging problems. And I like to really, you know, I like to really to challenge myself intellectually. And for me, antitrust consulting was never that great of a challenge. It was all kind of just like using really basic stuff to try and make a case. And so, mm -hmm. uh, there, you know, every so often you do something kind of interesting, but it was a very small percentage of the time. And mostly I was like going through huge boxes of documents and 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 stuff like that and i just i don't know it it wasn't for me it's for like i say it's for some people some people really think this is very exciting stuff but it was not for me i got into it for the wrong reasons uh -huh. so yeah well the, the other thing that comes to me and i hope i'm not i'm not outing either of us by saying this is that we both come from very progressive left-wing families um and i'm wondering whether the work you were doing like felt okay like to be you know to be on the side of the bigger business the biggest business the the monopoly like was any of that at, at play for you to some degree yes um that was definitely i was definitely aware of that i was aware that the people i was working with were really kind of buttoned down and again i was very young at the time and i hadn't totally figured out who i was i I mean, I knew I had this background from my family, but, you know, I went into work wearing button down shirts and I couldn't honestly tell you that that was against my identity because I really hadn't formed my identity. I was 27 and I still hadn't figured it out. I mean, maybe some people figure out who they are by that age, but I still really hadn't figured it out. And um, and and so I and so and so I think something about it was was a little bit uncomfortable for me. But it's interesting because it wasn't on the surface. 
I mean, my father, you know, was was alive at that time still, of course, and 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 he knew what I did, and he didn't have any uh, moral opposition to it. He didn't think there was anything wrong with it. And in fact, my father by that time had kind of moved on from a lot of his very kind of socially conscious like uh, uh, activities. You know, the sorts of things he had done when he had kind of a more you know, sort of uh, uh, make the world a better place kind of career. He was uh, he was at that time himself working for a law firm and he was by his own admission. He's uh -huh. like basically said, OK, I've had enough of all this other stuff. I just want to make some money now. And, uh, you know, <laughs> well, looking back, I mean, that itself have, to hear my father say that sort of with my own sense of who my father was, was kind of disillusioning. But, you know, everybody's got to make their, their decisions for themselves. So anyway, I wasn't getting any pushback from my dad on this whole thing. Um, and maybe just for your listeners, gotcha. uh, gotcha. I'll just sort of, since we've talked about, you know, having this, these kind of leftist backgrounds, I'll, 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 I'll mention for the record what my dad did. So probably the most iconic thing he did was for 12 years. Yeah, it was 12 years. He was the executive director of the, uh, New Jersey chapter of the American civil liberties union. So he headed up the New Jersey office. Um, did that for 12 years. And that was, those were my formative years. Um, and then from that, right. he moved on that's to, what I, that's where I remember him. Yeah. Yeah. And then he moved on when we were in high school, he was actually working in Washington DC for, um, the migrant legal action project. So he was actually providing, uh, he was working for a nonprofit that was providing legal help to migrant farm workers. Um, and it's at that point that he kind of did his about face and he went to work, uh, as, um, as corporate counsel for a uh, for a technology law firm or actually i'm sorry no he wasn't at a technology uh -huh. law firm he went on to a law firm later but he was corporate counsel for actually a, a, a firm that was uh that that in the technology sector gotcha yep yeah so uh yeah, yeah. and that so was in, in, that, interesting that, that time, radical that time was weird for me because my because i i'd had this idea of who my dad was and then now look what my dad was doing so yeah all right, well, let's let's continue with with your trajectory. So antitrust consulting for a while and then where? Yeah, so antitrust consulting for a while. Then I, I went to work for the Federal Communications Commission, so federal government. And that was kind of a natural step for me in some ways as, as sort of an exit strategy from antitrust consulting, because for, for uh, because because having worked on uh, actually, I worked on a telecommunications merger when I was in antitrust. And uh, so I was kind of had this natural way of selling myself to a telecommunications regulatory agency. And also it helped, it helped, no doubt, that my PhD advisor was the chief economist at the time. So, uh, so that was a natural uh -huh. move for me. At and the I FCC. Did, yes, at the FCC, yeah. And so I, I worked, I, I worked uh -huh. at the FCC for two years. I enjoyed that. A lot of smart people there. Uh, a lot of people who really were, were trying to do good. And, uh, and, 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 and just, you know, the whole being, being at that age, you know, sort of, um, about 30 years old working in Washington was, was really a great place to be as well. Um, so where did I go from there? That, so, so that would have been like the, the, so that would have been like 95, 96. Yeah, that was in fact, 96 to 98. Okay. And and then and so there then was a lot ended, going on in those at, at that time. Yeah, well, there wasn't the telecommunications industry. I I don't know how far we want to go into this, but it just so happened that Congress had just passed the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which was a big deal. It introduced competition to a lot of areas of the industry, and the FCC was charged with doing a whole lot of stuff. So it was an exciting time to beat the FCC. I mean, there were a lot of new people who had just been hired, and we were all trying to deal with with how everything was changing. And there were a lot of mergers. And, and I, because I'd had this background in antitrust, I kind of got put on what you could call the merger strike team. So whenever there was a merger, <laughs> we'd all be called into the chief economist's office, and uh, which at first was my advisor, and then later on somebody else, uh, Mike Reardon, who I uh, was a professor at, um, gosh, where was he at the time? I think Northwest. No, he wasn't in Northwestern. I'm sorry. He was at uh, Columbia University. Right. And uh, so I worked with him very closely and then his successor. So it was it was kind of it was it was fun. I got to work on some interesting stuff there. Gotcha. All right. And then 
and then, uh, uh, well, well, so uh, yeah, then I, I, I took a job in New Jersey working for a satellite communications company in marketing. <laughs> like I said, oh, okay. Howie, I was wandering. As one does. I was wandering, as one does, uh -huh. yes, especially with a PhD in economics, right? So, so I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but one thing I knew I wanted to do is I didn't think I had done such a great job in consulting. And I felt kind of the need to prove myself in the private sector and to prove that I could like hold down a, a job in the for-profit sector and do well at it. So I took this job and they were happy to hire me because they, uh, they were impressed that I'd been at the FCC. And, uh, and it also gave me a chance to move back to New Jersey, um, which is where uh, my, uh, I just, just got married, coincident with that move as well. And my new wife uh, took a job, had taken a job up in New Jersey. So it gave us a chance to, uh, to, to, to live together um, up here in New York and, or in the New York area. And so I did that for, I did that for, it's funny, I did that for about four years. In fact, almost exactly four years with a little break in the middle of a year where, which, which occurred, I'll give you the dates of the break and you can kind of guess what I was doing. I was gone from that company from February 2000 to February 2001. And what I was doing is like, but I and a, 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 like four friends of mine uh, um, started a, uh, started up an internet startup company. Oh, wow. On S yeah. Silicon Alley in New York? Yeah, kind of. We weren't in New York. Our office, we had our office space in Summit, New Jersey. Actually, we, I'm sorry. We also did have a little satellite office in New York, but I almost never went there. I was going to Summit, uh -huh. New Jersey. Yeah. So we had this, we okay. had this idea and we had all, you know, like everybody does who does a startup, you know, you have a business plan, you have revenue projections and, you know, the revenue projections showed clearly that with the stock options I had, I was going to get very rich. And uh, of course that didn't uh -huh. happen. Um, uh, you know, because, uh, well, because I'll, I'll just, I'll just say at, at that point in 1999, I was, I was hired as a marketing director for a consulting company in New York. And a lot of our early clients and prospects were these Silicon Alley firms and none of them had revenue projections. Like the fact that you, that you had revenue projections. <laughs> well, it's a projection is one thing. You can project anything you want, but the question is, you know, can you actually get, get the revenues? And uh, yeah, we actually did have a paying client for part of that time. We had one paying client, so we did have some revenues. And that was, that was a big selling point. Um, but in the end, at the end of the day, the revenues were not covering the costs and, uh, and, and it didn't take off uh -huh. from there. Yeah. It, also, our timing was kind of late. We were, um, as I said, we launched early. Well, we launched a little bit before. I think my, a couple of my friends were already on board in late 1999. I joined the firm February 2000. And that, if you remember, was kind of, if you will, the Cretaceous period of the internet boom. So we were coming on just as the, co the comet was kind of making its way for the whole industry. And uh, yeah, it was so March, I only had March 2000, everything. Yeah. One month after I joined this company, the head, every, there was a big crash. Yeah. That's right. Yep. yep. That didn't immediately yep. dry up all the money, but it dried up a lot of the money. And, um, and so, so by, by the beginning of 2001, I had pretty much decided I wanted to move on from that and, uh, and, and move back to something a little bit more stable. Um, you know, among other things, uh, uh, we were expecting our first child. So, so I, I went back long story short, I went back to telecommunications, that job, uh, working for the satellite communications company. They actually had me back. Uh, it was interesting. I didn't even really uh -huh. have to interview. I just pulled up my old boss and well, he had me come into the office just to chat. And then I had my job back. It was really uh -huh. remarkable. Okay. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So, so however, I'm not going to ask you what the, what the startup was, because I'll find that too interesting. It'll take us too far off track, but someday I'll find out. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So let's not, you know, let's not go into that. You could look it up. It's a company called Z rep. And in fact, I, who knows if you'll find anything, if you look it up, actually, if you Google Z rep, Z R E P, you're probably going to find the patent that we had issued on our technology because we actually filed a patent and 
I'm the mm. main person named on the patent. I'm the primary person. In fact, one of my primary jobs was basically to write this patent working with a lawyer. And uh, I, spent a, oh, wow. I spent about okay. a month doing that. All right. I bet that comes in handy at uh, party games. <laughs> Two truths and a lie. <laughs> Two truths and a lie. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. So anyway, what was really, I think, best, I mean, there were a lot of good things about working at the startup, but I think the best thing was it was actually while I was at the startup that I finally figured out what I wanted to do with my life, which is I wanted to actually go back to academia. It was really then that I realized mm. that. Uh, uh, it, it just kind of came home to me. And so even though I was restarting my job at the satellite communications company, like within months after that happened and after our son was born, I was turning, you know, after well, a few months of like no sleep after my son was born and, and, and just, you know, also basking and having a new child, I, I sort of my mind kind of returned to is like, OK, so do I really want to stay at this company or well, maybe I actually I want to go back to academia. And so over the next basically year and a half, I kind of worked to make that happen, which was not an easy thing. But I managed, I was very lucky. I got a tenure track job at the City University of New York, not at the campus I'm at now, but at a different campus called Lehman College in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just, I don't know, I just consider myself to be so fortunate because uh, if, if you, in, at least in my field, in economics, if you get a PhD and then you go out and do something else that's not academic and you don't do any publishing, it's very, very hard to get back in. And I was just lucky that 10 years after I, I got my PhD, I was really, I was able to go back and actually get, you know, get a very good tenure track job at a, at a good institution. And, and, you know, from there, uh, my pro career progressed. I was able to actually publish and I got, uh, I got tenure and, and I guess you could say the rest is history. Or economics. Yeah. So economics, right. Not, not exactly history. Yeah. <laughs> so when when you decided uh, when you're at the startup and you, and you realized I want to go back to academia, did was it just sort of the vibe and the t the tasks, or were there like burning questions that your you know your decade in the in the private sector and in, in government had kind of left you with like things you really were curious about? It wasn't really burning questions per se. It was kind of figuring out what it is I like to do, what gives me energy when I do it. And that mm. boiled down to two things. I like to create concepts. I like to basically be creative and come up with ideas as to how things work, sort of, you know, models or, you know, conceptual machines in some sense, you know, sort of mm. things that have interesting working that, that, that solve problems. And so I like to create these things that that I really love, love to do. And the other thing I really love to do is explain things to people. So I, I love to kind of just like talk about, you know, ideas that were of interest to me and 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 economics was kind of a natural thing to talk about. So I was thinking, OK, so. All right. So I like I like explaining things to people and I like creating things. So what, what's the intersection of these things? What kind of career is that? And it, it, it was an academic career. It was just, you know, it was obvious that to me at that point that I was meant to teach and do research. So mm. uh, so it wasn't I, I didn't know what I was going to. Well, OK, so over after I figured that out, I spent the next year, you know, on the job market trying to piece together a strategy and try and make a pitch and say, OK, here are the papers I'm going to write that I'm going to, you know, mm. have have rolling in my first year as a professor that are going to get published. And so I came up with a plan, but it wasn't like I was brought to that by a burning desire to do anything in particular. I hadn't quite yeah. figured that out yet. And it was just basically a way to get me into doing the research and doing the teaching. Gotcha. So now, now you're, uh, you're tenure tracked. You, you have um, a, a, a promise of, of output. And so what, what caught your attention? What, what got you really, what concepts and, and things that needed explaining, you know, started lighting you up? Yeah, you know, actually, it's interesting. Pretty quickly, I came back around to behavioral economics. And I say came back around to it because when I had been in graduate school, I had sort of discovered this area of economics for myself. Um, I mean, nominally, the fields that I was studying 
in graduate school were econometrics and industrial organization, which is what we talked about before, the economics of competition. But I had kind of written a paper on deceptive advertising for one of my classes. And I said, well, why does deceptive advertising actually deceive people if, if everybody, you know, all of my economics professors are telling me people are rational? And I was like, no, no, wait, people are not rational. That's kind of a stupid idea. Well, what are people if they're not rational? And I started to read more about what people were writing on this. And not too many people were writing about it at the time. This is a long time ago. This is the late 80s. And not a lot had been done on this yet. But there were some people, there were a couple guys whose names kept popping up again and again. There was this guy, Danny Kahneman, and this other guy, Amos Tversky. And I kept on coming across their articles. And I'm like, hey, what these guys are talking about is really interesting. And I was like, I kind of want to work in this area. I want to figure out why people aren't thinking straight. Why, why are people not rational? What are they actually doing? Mm -hmm. And uh, so this was back when I was in graduate school. I, I, I told, you know, I told, you know one of my uh, faculty mentors, I wanted to do this. And she's like, she's like, no, you can't do that. Nobody knows what that's called yet. We did, in fact, we didn't even have the term behavioral economics then. And she's like, nobody will know what you're doing. And so when you go on the job market, nobody is going to know what you're going to teach and you're not going to get a job. So don't do this. You know, I was going to, I was going to say like, like wanting to do that back then, like to this day, you know, classical economists, Turn, turn down their nose at behavioral stuff. There's been, there's been a lot of, you know, replication <laughs> crises in it, like, the, you know, um, but back, back then, I mean, I remember reading that when, when Kahneman and Tversky published their first paper, they didn't even know what to call it. So they made up a name called prospect theory that yeah. meant absolutely nothing just because yeah. they didn't know what they were doing. Yeah. That wasn't their first paper. They, 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 they'd been doing oh. some pretty interesting stuff in the, in the early seventies. But, um, okay. but yeah, when they did the prospect theory paper in 1979, you're absolutely right. I heard the same story. They, they were like, well, what do we call this? And they're like, well, how about prospect theory? And they just kind of made it up. Um, <laughs> and sure enough, that's, you know, that's, that's a, such a famous area today. Okay. Okay. So you, so you were into this kind of, you know, a bit of rebellion against the academy. Yeah, I wanted to do this, but actually I kind of let you know, that mentor and some other people talk me out of it. But well, I mean, I, I, I didn't entirely, I, I let her talk me out of doing that as my dissertation, but mm -hmm. I still wrote the paper, the paper that I'd written for that class, working with another mentor, uh, a guy named William Dickens, who actually did some, was doing some of what you would now call behavioral economics back in the day. Uh, under his advice, I actually submitted it for publication at the Journal of Public Economics. And after, you know, some back and forth, it got published. It was my first publication. And that's a pretty good journal, actually. So I was I was really excited about that. But it ended up not even being part of my dissertation. My dissertation was really on on competition issues, you know, the kind of things that uh -huh. kind of lead you to a career in antitrust. Uh -huh. So it was later on. So again, this was kind of a flashback, right? We were talking about what I did when I when I when I first took you know, return to academia and I was working as an assistant professor. So how did I figure out what I wanted to do? Well, I remembered kind of this interest in, in behavioral economics and uh, and I really kind of quickly gravitated back toward it. Um, in fact, I remember right around that time when I was just kind of just coming back to academia, I uh, I even sent an email to uh, to Danny Kahneman who was at that time at Princeton. I had known, I'd actually known Kahneman when I was in graduate school because after I figured out, you know, hey, who is this, you know, him and Tversky, who are these great, you know, guys doing this really interesting stuff? Uh, Bill Dickens told me, uh, my mentor uh, uh, in that area told me, he's like, well, Kahneman is actually now on the faculty of Berkeley in psychology, you should go out at his course. And so I ended up meeting him and, uh, and he even, you know, he, he read this paper that I submitted to the journal Public Economics and gave me pointers on it. So I had, I, I'd known him, so I reached out to him when I returned to academia, but my timing was terrible. I sent the email to him. I, I mean, I knew this had happened. He had just been awarded the Nobel Prize about a month before. And yeah. so, I, so I'm like, gosh, I'm gonna still try and, and reach out to him. So I sent him an email and I, I wanted to get his advice on, you know, and basically on my career now that I was returning to academia. And he respond, he actually responded to me. He said, he said, I'm sorry, I, I don't have time to respond to your email because I have to go to Stockholm. 
<laughs> and so, so, so he, I never, I never heard back from him, not surprisingly, other than that, but that was pretty cool. <laughs> wow. All right. So I kind of want to um, like maybe explore the rest of the, the research in terms of the, the book uh, manuscript that you're working on and the, um, you know, what, what I saw. So maybe maybe we can kind of uh, backfill by by jumping right into like you you tell first the the book title capital actually yeah so so this is a book okay so it's a book about capital nominally so so what is capital you know I think most people when they think of capital they think about money and investments they say okay it's you know it's it's these these kind of financial capital type of things. Some, you know, there's some people who may have taken a course in economics and they say, oh, capital. Yeah. Capital and labor. Right. Aren't those like the inputs to production? And then there's still other people who are going to say, oh, wait, I think I've heard of this term capital. Like, hey, isn't that like isn't like education, human capital or, you know, isn't this this thing called social capital? So people have heard of capital, but it's funny. It's one of these things that I don't think most people really even have a have a sense of kind of the big the big picture of what it is. And uh, so I, I think people would be kind of hard pressed to actually come up with a definition of it, most folks. Um, and yet at the same time, this concept is really kind of a lightning rod. I mean, there's there's, you know, some notorious books, if you will, with capital in the title, one of which was written by a fellow named uh, Karl Marx. And so and that has elicited some very strong reactions. And then also more recently, um, there's a book, uh, the book, of course, that that. Uh, probably your your listeners viewers are familiar with by Thomas Piketty, Capital in the Twenty First Century, which is a kind of a a new look at at, at capital. But but in a lot of ways, um, it's similar to 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 Marx's book and 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 to that sort of perspective, in that it um, it addresses mainly inequality and um, and and class struggle in some sense. So. Mm -hmm. So these are very, you know, obviously these topics are very controversial and they're lightning rods. Some people feel very strongly about the problem of inequality. Other people say, uh, you know, think that it's uh, that 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 it, that's not where we should be putting our attention. And then on the other side of the spectrum, there's also books about capital that are all about capital accumulation, basically telling you how you can get rich. So they kind of, you know, they lionize capital accumulation. So it's either one or the other. So when people think about capital, they think about these kind of you know, extreme views that people feel politically charged about. My book isn't about that at all. It's not about either of those things. It's 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 really more a book about how to, you know, what what makes a life well lived. Um, so in some sense, you know, I, I write this as an economist, but it's it's almost not even a book of economics. So you just made a huge jump in my mind from all these uh, economic terms, you know, money, in, investment, input to production, to a life well lived. What on earth does capital, understanding what it is at this more fundamental level, have anything to do with the quality of our, of our lives? Yeah, so, so the key thing is to actually come up with a definition of what capital is. As I, as I, as I said before, I, you know, most people probably wouldn't be able to to define that they can say, you know, well, I think it consists of this or that or the other thing, but what is it? And so capital, if, if, if I think if you were to come up with a sort of a basic definition of it, it's um, anything, it consists of anything that is a durable store of value. So what does that mean? It's basically anything that lasts and that has some value mainly to humans. Okay. So, all right, money and investments, clearly durable stores of value. But if you think about it also, you know, things like have, like a car or a house are also durable stores of value. And if you think even more about it, you say, hey, well, wait, my education is also a durable store of value. You know, I've gotten this college education and postgraduate education. And these things have some value to me, not just in terms of making money, but in terms of enriching my life. But as you dig even further, you realize that it's even more pervasive than that. Capital includes your physical body, your physical the fitness of your body. So when you 
exercise regularly, you're building capital, you're building an ability, something of durable value that will allow you to do other things like play sports well or, and, and live longer and, and things like that. So your body is capital as well. Your health is capital. Your relationships with people are capital. And so it's like almost everywhere you look, there's capital of some kind there. It really pervades every aspect of our lives. And, 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 and there's, so that's kind of exciting. But then what you, what you realize as you think about this is, gosh, in some sense, I'm really dependent on capital. Uh, and in fact, if you think about all the things that capital is, if we didn't have any capital, uh, we wouldn't even be able to survive. I mean, if, if all the things, you know, such as my physical health, you know, if I didn't have those things, I'd be dead. So capital is essential to survival. And, and also, and, and, and perhaps equally startling, it's essential to our identity. Everything that uh, I think I would use to characterize who I am, you know, probably most people would use to characterize themselves, involves some aspect of their capital. You know your 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 occupation, what you what you know about, uh, your 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 strengths, your qualities. All of these are elements of of durable stores of value to you. They, they, they're they're it's your capital that defines you as who you are. And so, without capital, you have no no personhood. Uh, so it's 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 something that is is terribly essential to us. So this is kind of where. I think in the book, I really transition to our relationship to capital and how fraught it is. I, 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 and, and, and this is what concerns me. This is the main concern of the book is that um, there's this thing called capital that we don't, we don't even, most of us, it's not like on the tip of our minds. And yet it, it's, it controls the way we live. Much of our lives is lived, I believe, for, for many of us at least, is lived in fear of what our lives would be like if we didn't have X, Y, or Z. Like, you know, if if I woke up tomorrow and I lost my job or if I, you know, if if suddenly I, I went into a room and people didn't know who I was, you know, these are these are very deep seated fears. They may not be on the surface of our minds, but but they're there and they have to do with capital. And in some sense, capital is really is really ruling our existence. And, 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 it, and it's 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 sort of a lot of our life, our lives for many people, at least, mm -hmm. I think is lived out of basically trying to avoid vulnerability, trying to avoid this situation in which I'm, I'm, I'm either not going to have these, these critical elements of capital that I rely upon or this, or this aspect of identity that, that I rely upon. So, so I want to push back a little bit on the definition, uh, maybe, you know, stress test. Cause one thing that came, that came up for me is like, is that definition so broad that it doesn't exclude anything like like if, if that's capital then what is it yeah i mean so capital well i'll tell you one thing that's that capital is not capital is not what you actually are doing in the moment okay so i want to make a distinction here in, in talking about capital between something that economists call a stock a stock of capital and what economists call flows. Okay. So the stock is that item of capital, all of those things that I've been talking about, which may sound, you know, very expansive, but, but these things that you have that are your source of power, or your source of, of value are stocks, but flows are the things that you do. It's, you know, it's, it's the enjoyment of a conversation, like the one that we're having or the, enjoyment of, of, of um, playing a game of ultimate Frisbee or, you know, any kind of activity, anything that you, that you, that, that, that you get benefit from just in the moment, just doing something. And that's not capital. That's a very different thing. And in, you know, in some sense, these flows depend upon capital. You can't play ultimate Frisbee if you don't have some level of skill at throwing the Frisbee or some level of fit, physical fitness. But, um, but when you're in the flow of it, when you're actually doing it, you're not thinking about your stocks at all. You're just kind of doing mm. what you're doing. 
Now, I don't know well, if actually, I actually you know, sometimes I do think <laughs> I think I may have dodged your question. Well, you, you, <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, you talked about ultimate Frisbee, which is all like, you know, <laughs> like throwing, throwing me a very juicy bone. <laughs> but what came up for me when you said like, OK, so that, so that the, the flow is the experiential ephemera that actually is the the warp and woof of life. That, yeah. that that capital can, that capital can make possible because I also need cleats. I also need a field that I can access that has you know grass growing on it and drainage and you know the dog poop is picked up and it's a safe neighborhood. All those things you could you could regard as capital. But what I got what it got to me is like there are moments when I'm playing when I do think about my stock and that's when the things that's when it's no more fun. If I'm thinking about like if I've injured myself and I'm like damn it, I can't run right now. Or I'm playing so badly, what happened to my skill? <laughs> right, the, the move, thinking about stocks in that moment actually takes me out of the enjoyment of the flow. Yeah, I think that's a, that, that's a very astute observation. I, I agree with you completely. And, and, and I can remember from my days playing Ultimate Frisbee, which were a little bit longer ago than yours, I think you're still playing. I, I still remember that, that I was most enjoying it when I wasn't thinking about my body or about about what I had, you know, but if, if, if something, right, if you, if you realize that you have a pain in your body or something, or, or, you know, or, or, you know, you start thinking about things rather than just doing, that's when you lose your enjoyment. And, and I think that's, and I think also, I want to go back to, you use the word ephemera. That's such a critical part of flows. It, that's exactly, exactly. I think what they are, they're, they're ephemeral that, that, that really sort of characterizes what a flow is the enjoyment the things that we do are are fleeting. They're 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 in motion. They're dynamic, and uh, you can't just kind of freeze them and just point to them and say there there it is. That's a thing. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of it's kind of a, a dynamic uh, a dynamic thing that is, is by its very nature is fleeting. And and um, and yet and yet all of life, you know, all of the stuff of life is really in the in those ephemera. Hmm. So I don't know if this is off topic or a bad time to bring it up, but what just occurred to me when you'd mentioned, you talked about Danny Kahneman and this idea of the ephemera of life being like the warp and woof of, 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 of our experience and our well-being. Danny Kahneman gave a TED talk. I don't know if it was his first one or his only one, but it was about sort of the, the experiencing self and the remembering self. And I'm wondering whether that distinction plays into like, do you want to have a life in which in this moment I'm in, I'm in the flow and I'm hearing, you know, Mihai checks at Mihai's, you know, self uh, improvement, self development, psychological theory of flow in the word flow, or is it that I want to have a life that I can look back on? Like, is it, is that part of what you're working with here? Yeah, that's, it's very interesting that you bring that up. I'm familiar with, with Kahneman's research on that. And, and in fact, if you look at his book, um, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, there's a chapter in that book called Two Selves. And that chapter deals specifically with this whole issue that, that really there are two selves. There's the experiencing self and the remembering self. And, and very often the remembering self will remember things that are different from the way they are being experienced at the time. And the research can actually show that there's a difference in the perception during the experience and how it was remembered. Um, so what, you know, so what are we looking for in life? This is a very deep philosophical question. Are we looking to have a life that we remember well, or are we looking to have a life that, that we enjoy as we experience it, as, as, we're, as we are experiencing it? And, um, you know, I, I think that we want to have both, but I think that I tend, at least in this book, to come down on the importance of experience in the moment. I think that in our society today, perhaps we put too much emphasis on memories, on the remembrance of things. Mm. We, we hear, you know, vacation destinations like, you know, trip, for example, you know, how is Walt Disney World marketed to people, right? It's marketed as here's uh, something that's going to produce great memories for you. Hmm. And I, I just kind of have to shake my head at that. It's like if life is all about the memories, if you're when you're actually in some beautiful place, if all you're focused on is I have to take pictures of this so I can look at it later. 
are you not kind of missing it right now in the moment? And doesn't that miss most of what life's about? I mean, for me, at least, I, I guess what I'm saying is I, I come down on one side of this, probably 80%, 90%, which is, I, I think you got to live in the moment. Mm -hmm. and that, that's such a, that's such a um, weird, <laughs> um, you know, outcome of an economics perspective on life. <laughs> like, I love it. Like, you know, capital flows, stocks live in the moment is like, it's like such a beautiful and unexpected takeaway. Yeah, well, it, it doesn't, it, it kind of seems like, you know, how would an economist ever get to there, right? I mean, if you had to think about anybody who you'd expect to be kind of more about like, uh, you know, accumulation is where it's at, you know, really mm -hmm. the stocks are where it's at, you'd think an economist, why, why is an economist talking about flows? And I, I guess it's because, you know, yeah, I'm an economist, but I'm also kind of this person who's been, had this kind of journey, you know, which some, which we've talked about, I mean, kind of going from one job to another, trying to find myself, I've, I've kind of lived the life of a seeker to some degree. And, and I've thought very deeply, especially as I've gotten into middle age about, you know, what's it all about. And so uh, that's not just so I'm, it's the economist talking in the book, but it's also kind of this person who's just kind of, you know, wondering what really matters. Yeah. But th there's something about economics that I think has, has generally not lent itself to these bigger questions. Like economics has sort of come up with a bunch of sort of, you know, assumptions that it's been based on. And you're basically saying, well, what if we go below the assumptions? What if, you know, if economics is simply a branch of philosophy, right? And we have, we have um, experiments we can run and we have data we can look at, but what if economics was not just in the service of GDP or uh, equality, but in the surface of something deeper, like, you know, like, you know, there's like the happiness index, but something even, even more fundamental than that, which is what you, what you, what you said when you, we started talking about this, what is a life well lived? Yeah. And I think that, that that may sound kind of revolutionary, but it's really not. I mean, uh, gosh, of all people, Adam Smith actually already had the idea that economics should be a branch of philosophy. It, it, so everybody thinks about his book, uh, The Wealth of Nations which is the one in which he talked about the invisible hand. But he also wrote another book, actually an earlier book called A Theory of Moral Sentiments. And that book, I mean, that some people consider that to be the first book of behavioral economics, because it's really hmm. about how the activities that we normally consider in the purview of economics, how they intersect with psychology and philosophy and, and, and really, you, you know, how, how you really can't distinguish one from the other. Um, but, but more recently, I think there's definitely an, a, a, a groups of economists that seem to care, that have, have, have taken an interest in the more philosophical side of economics. I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those, but, th but there are other people who are really interested in sort of more moral issues and how, um, you know, how the decisions that we analyze in economics relate to morality and to, and to other philosophical uh, areas of inquiry. And so and so you have, um, well, you know, a number of a number of universities, uh, including some very prominent ones, have uh, programs in politics, philosophy and economics, what's called PPE, and mm -hmm. uh, that really unite those three disciplines. And in fact, uh, there's a, a, a a politics, philosophy, and an economic society, a PPE society that has an annual conference that I attended last year um, and presented a paper there. So, and, and those are, it was a fantastic conference. I've only been to one of those, but I got to meet uh, philosophers. In fact, I'd say, you know, a plurality of the people at that conference were philosophers. Then the second largest group was economists and then, and then political scientists. But it was really great to, to see what the philosophers were talking about, particularly the ones who were kind of also interested in economics because, you know, they were talking about things that were, you know, kind of more on the, on the edge of philosophy that, that was kind of interesting to me. And, uh, it, it, but it was just fascinating. I, I think, I think, I think these sort of interdisciplinary, uh, mashups and pursuits are, 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 are always really interesting, mm -hmm. uh, when, when, when people sort of get out of their silos and, 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 you know, talk to people from other disciplines. All right. So I want, I want to, um, 
stick a pin in, in the question that I want to get to, which is, okay, so if we're looking at flows and, and stocks separately and kind of distinct, like what, what does that mean? What's, 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 what's your, you know, if you were writing the self-help book, what would be in that? But before we go there, so I think since the last time we talked, Milton Friedman's legacy has been in the news, um, you know, probably the most, you know, famous economist of the late 20th century, you know, very media savvy, um, you know, very invisible hand, um, part of the Chicago school, and really about lionizing another word that's extremely charged, capitalism, which, as I understood it, was like that cap the purpose of capital is to make more capital. Um, yeah. And I'm, wonder, I'm wondering, how, did, how does your, your thinking and your work on capital relate to capitalism? Well, I sort of have two answers to that. I think, I, think on, on, I think on the most primary level, this book is not really about whether capitalism is good or bad. Um, I don't want to emphasize that because I think any book with capital in the title kind of, it's important that, you know, that, that it sort of respond to that. You know, is this a book about capitalism? And if it's a book about capitalism, does it think capitalism's good? Does it think capitalism's bad? What position does it take? My book doesn't take a position, um, and deliberately so. I, I actually, so if the book, what the book I think is really about is, as we've been talking about, this idea of a flow orientation. So is a flow orientation, as opposed to a stock orientation, is that anti-capitalistic? And I would argue that it's not. Uh, you'll find people that, you know, sort of we would normally classify as either left of center or right of center, um, embodying uh, contradictions uh, on this point. You know, people that you would expect, okay, well, well, they've got these politics, they would certainly be, you know, all about stock orientation, not about flows. They're actually, they actually have, you know, sort of embody some contradictions about this. And one example uh, that I, I would give is Anne Rand. So Anne Rand in, in Atlas Shrug, I think, really kind of comes out for this idea of rejecting uh, sort of traditional ways of thinking, rejecting ossified institutions, allowing individuals to pursue what they think is, is best, you know, based upon you know, just basically setting aside these institutions, which which really, if you think about it, is totally flow oriented. But Anne Rand's her philosophy is that well, why do you want to do this? Well, the main purpose in in in, in throwing aside these ossified institutions is to see you can better make money. Well, that is stock oriented. So, mm -hmm. you know, on the one hand, she's kind of a flow oriented person, but on the other hand, kind of a stock oriented person. And here's somebody that we you know, we, we definitely have some political uh, preconceptions about. Well, let's let's come back to ultimate. So <laughs> like, for, like, instead of making money, I hear like score points, win games, like, which is a great part of the fun. Like, I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's I'm not just playing catch, right? I'm doing yeah. something competitive. But the the score is not the like the like this, you know, keeping score is not the point, but it facilitates the enjoyment of the flow for me, not for everybody. There's people who prefer catch or very casual games where no one's keeping score. But so, so couldn't making money be a form of flow? It can certainly catalyze flow. And I think you make a very good point. Um, so there's a book, uh, a, a, another book, um, actually called Flow, you may have heard of it. It's by a Hungarian a psychologist whose name is, I'm really going to make an attempt to pronounce his name, but it's a very difficult name to pronounce. Uh, Mahali Chichent Mahali, I believe is his name. So if you read his book, it's interesting. He, he, he says that, you know, the, the best way to have optimal experience is to be involved in an activity that provides sufficient challenge, but not excessive challenge, that, that, you, that where the challenges are matched to a person's abilities and skills. And so a great game of ultimate Frisbee is a flow experience, not just, not, I mean, based upon uh, uh, Chichen Mahali's uh, concept mm -hmm. of flow, because it is challenging. It pushes us to use our skills to the limit, but doesn't push us so far that we feel completely disoriented. 
It's just the optimal level of challenge. So how do you create these conditions of flow? Well, uh, as, as Chichen Mahali suggests in his book, you know, very often a competitive activity, uh, an activity which has a goal oriented around it, um, can produce this conditions of flow. But paradoxically, the focus on the goal itself can actually ruin the experience of flow. If you're overly focused just on winning games, mm -hmm. um, so that that becomes the be all and end all, the flow is gone. The flow requires to experience it, you do need that level of challenge that is often uh, uh, created by having a goal, but but the goal cannot, cannot again, be the all end all. Hmm. So I'm thinking about like, if you were hired as the chief philosopher for Facebook or Amazon or, or Tesla, and you, you know, and these, these, you know, boy billionaires who are, you know, talking about like, who's got the most, who's got the highest net worth and, and are we going to fight in a cage match to like, what, 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 what advice do you think would be useful for them as you, as you imagine them? in terms of, you know, their own well-being. Well, I, I, I'm just I'm just getting this visual of like, what would it be like to you know, if somebody offered me the job of chief philosopher for, you know, like Tesla or Twitter or something? I mean, would I, <laughs> I don't know if I'd even want to go to work for him. But I mean, um, but what kind of advice would I give? Um, I, I think it, it get it. Yes, I think that. Well, here's the thing. So, so having a flow orientation, experiencing flow is in some sense an optimal experience, but I think that it alone is probably not sufficient for what makes a life well lived. I think it's important also to have a deep moral sense. So you can, you know, have this kind of great thrilling life and thrilling experience by challenging yourself constantly, but the challenges can be empty. And if the challenges don't ultimately mean something, if you don't feel like you're part of something larger, you're you're probably missing, well, you're missing, you know, something that you could be getting out of life for your own perspective. But I think also you're 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 missing some of the general point, which is we don't just live for ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and indeed, actually, I I, I want to say that in, in, the, that the book Capital, actually, my book, doesn't just talk about about a flow orientation from a personal perspective. It also sort of takes it the next step and says, well, what are the implications of this for how we live collectively, for uh, for how we relate to others, for how we build our societies? And, and I think there are very important um, implications there that uh, just as an individual can adopt a flow orientation, so too can a society. So so too can we as, as, as you know, in, in, in the institutions that we create together. Hmm. What that reminds me of is around 2007, 2008, I was, I was just starting to like have a really good marketing career. <laughs> um, I, I'd published a book and people weren't asking for references anymore. And I was really kind of getting into like, oh, I could really do this business thing. And then I, um, I came across this book called Tropical Nature, which was a, a book of, you know, it was basically a natural science book written about the tropics and different animals and plants and, and ecosystems. And it suddenly, it struck me, it was just a beautifully written book. And it struck me that, oh, like what I was looking at business had, is a subset of biology, hmm. right? Like everything we do is that everything humans do is we're just, you know, we're still biological creatures living on a, a finite planet. And one of the things that that the book kept saying is like every species in that book after you know billions of years of evolution only only the species that benefit their environments net net are still around and like the only species that sort of, that doesn't you know, that is not a net benefit to its environment is humans and we we may not have that much you know that much of a runway to get it right um, and kind of what I, what I hear you saying is like the, you know, one of the one of the parts of economics that I think that I think for, in terms of classical sense, in terms of homo economicus or, you know, rational, selfish man is that selfishness really isn't rational 
over any kind of longer time frame. Yeah, no, it's interesting that you bring an evolutionary perspective in on this and that you also bring up selfishness because uh, I'm going to be very tempted to take this on a tangent because I'm actually doing some research completely separate from the book on, um, on altruism and, um, and specifically its relationship to a behavioral economic phenomenon called the endowment effect. Um, what I've found in some earlier experiments, this is an unpublished working paper I've done with some folks at um, the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Uh, we found that uh, people who demonstrate in, 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 in these laboratory games, they demonstrate altruistic behavior, actually have um, a reduced uh, tendency for this thing called the endowment effect. And what that means, without sort of going into, into too many different things, it means they're actually, uh, one thing it means is that they're actually um, fitter participants in markets. People that don't exhibit the endowment effect are actually going to be able to take advantage of gains from trade that other people can't. So, so can you can you describe the endowment effect in a couple of sentences? Yeah, Just... yeah, real quick. Okay, so the endowment effect, it, it's, a, it's a result first found by Richard Thaler, the Nobel uh, laureate back in around 1980 in, in some laboratory experiments. So it's easiest to explain this just by telling you what experiments he did. So he, um, he took a group of Cornell students, divided them into two groups. Half the students received a Cornell t-shirt and the other half did not. Those who had the t-shirt were asked, what's the um, minimum amount that you would be willing to accept to, to, to give this t-shirt up? And those people who were not given the t-shirt were asked, what's the, um, the, the most that you'd be willing to pay to get a t-shirt like this? Okay. And remember, the students have been randomly assigned to these two groups. And what they found was the students that had been endowed with the t-shirts valued them about 70% more than the people who hadn't been, the students who had not been endowed with them. Just purely on the basis of being handed this t-shirt, suddenly you value it more. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and this is called, so it's called the endowment effect. And it's been replicated dozens, hundreds of times in, in, in you know, lots and lots of journal articles um, with all sorts of goods, not just t-shirts and but pens and chocolates and on and on and on. So anyway, we know that people behave this way. So what does it mean? Well, if you exhibit the endowment effect, it, it creates an unwillingness to trade in situations which would otherwise be advantageous to trade. And so it actually has implications for welfare in that some trades that should take place from the perspective of, well, they benefit people, just don't take place. So if it's in fact true, that what my sort of early uh, you know, laboratory evidence is, is showing that, that people who are altruistic have a smaller endowment effect, then altruists are actually, they have a, a level of fitness from the perspective of markets that other people don't have which is a strange thing because usually when we think about what, what we like about altruists is because they're nice to other people, but we don't, we, we think, you know, then you sort of think about, you know, Gordon Gecko from that movie, Wall Street saying greed is good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Basically, if you're an altruist, you're a chump, you're not going to do as well in this dog eat dog environment. Well, lo and behold, it appears that altruists actually do better in the dog eat dog environment than the people who are greedy. So if that's in fact true, it's very interesting. And it says something about, why maybe altruism survives. So coming back to what you, you know, you're sort of talking about uh, evolutionarily, you know, sort of biology governs all of this. Um, so one, one thing we, we got to ask is we, why are people that are giving away things to other people, you know, that would presumably make them less fit and, and less likely to survive? Why do these people survive? Well, maybe it's because there's something else about what they're doing that is actually conducive to their survival. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, just when you were talking about the, the, uh, the t-shirts, like I just had this experience on a very sort of intense scale, having a bunch of my stuff in storage for five months and then coming back and looking at it <laughs> and, and, and having all sorts of like incredibly, like from a market, pers from a, from an economic perspective, totally irrational ideas about should so let I me share guess. this? Let me guess. So you came back to this stuff and you're like, why did I even ever want this stuff? Is that was that what your response was? Or some of it. Some of it was that. Some of it was I really want this in Europe. And even though I could buy a new one, I would pay more money to ship the old one. Um, some of it was like I, I, I brought over a, a Mac mini, which is a, a basically a flat box computer 
that you then have to get everything for keyboard, mouse, monitor, and and I and I forgot the core, the elect the uh, electric cable for the yeah. Mac Mini, which I'm not using. I have a per this, right now. I'm, I'm I'm on a perfectly good laptop. I don't have a lot of space, so setting this big thing up would be a problem. But I I keep going to my, my Amazon cart and trying to decide whether I want to buy the cable that I no longer have because I had it. Right. <laughs> right. But, but yeah. so I can tell, like, there's nothing, there's nothing rational. It's, it's all, it's all about feelings for things rather than what's, you know, how, what decision will put me in the best position going forward. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, so yeah, what you're talking about there, you know, uh, one characterization of it is, is loss aversion. So if, if you consider, you know, if you think of yourself in order to be whole, you know, if I think of, you know, what makes me whole, it's having X, Y, and Z. And one of these things is that cord for that, you know, for that Mac mini. And That's without exactly. it, I feel like something is missing and I have to bring myself back to wholeness, you yes. know? So, you know, you're going to ask yourself, well, why is that? I mean, you know, it sort of seems emotional, but, but there's, there's a, there are theories that this actually has evolved into us, that there are reasons that we, that we're encoded this way, because it actually was a, a, a favorable trait at some point in the past. In fact, one of the theories is that back when people were hunter gatherers, you know, or, you know, sort of primitive societies had to kind of, be clingy to this because this the resources were so scarce that if you lost something, it was, it, it could mean your very survival. So, so people got, you know, sort of obsessed about maintaining their, their, their endowment. Uh huh. Although, I mean, the, the indigenous communities that I've ever interacted with, which have not been, you know, anthropological over a long period of time, but, you know, as a tourist, take it for what it's worth, like, we spent some time when we were living in South Africa in, in Botswana, um, you know, it's in, in villages adjacent to existing San Bushman communities. And right. Like, uh, you know, we, we'd go to the big um, mall and we'd see something like a, you know, a cherry pitter or a, you know, an avocado scoop or something like, like what would we say? Like, what would the San think of this? And like, whatever they had, they could just get another one because they were actually living in the factory. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like if they wanted a new toothbrush, they would just you know, pluck another twig off of the, of the toothbrush tree. Or <laughs> isn't there a movie about this called the gods must be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a problematic uh, movie. I, I saw it recently. And it, it, uh, there's yeah, a lot probably, that I missed just the first time. Yeah, it, it probably doesn't, you know, live up over over the decades. I, I saw it back in the day. Yeah, yeah, it definitely romanticizes, you know, and you know, sort of like let's let's not like mix different. Yeah, anyway, but but there is there was there was a, a truth to like this idea of like again, it's like you know simplicity. So one you know one of the books that influenced me a lot when I first read it was um, uh, Ishmael by a philosopher, um, Daniel Quinn, I believe. Um, and he, he and it's, it's an, unlikely, I don't know if you know the book. Um, it's an unlikely, I'll describe it in a way that will make you think, why the hell would he want to read that? It's about a, um, a sentient um, um, gorilla, sentient in terms of, you know, human sentience, who's, who's um, you know, um, can, can communicate, um, What's the word? Psycho. <laughs> um, using using um, uh, uh, like hand hand signals or what? I mean, how do? Because I've heard you know chimpanzees will do pictographs. Yeah. And, no, okay. this is this is like fantasy. This is like I I keep the word that keeps coming into my mouth is psychopathically, but that's not the word I'm looking for. <laughs> like like ESP can communicate. Oh oh really telepathically. Telepathically, there we go. <laughs> huh. So, okay. And so and so the book is about the full you know this this um, gorilla in captivity. And his theories based on observing humans but not being a human. So it's kind of, you know, flat land or alien sort of. Yeah. And and one of the things he talks he talks about the difference between the two types of human societies, takers and leavers. And takers are the ones who want stocks, and the leavers, he says, sort of live in the hand of God, which which is to say you trust that there will that, that, like someone who is altruistic 
has a level of trust in their environment that feels just if just from a neurological perspective very fit in terms yeah. of I'm not, I'm not stressing all the time yeah yeah you know it's interesting i mean coming back to like right do primitive societies did this evolve from pr from for primitive societies i guess i guess there's sort of primitive societies and primitive societies there was a sort of early yeah. very early you know, sort of human existence, which was, which was so, there was so much scarcity that, 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 yeah. that it was a real problem. But then, but then there are sort of, I guess, sort of intermediate societies where I've read, there's actually research on, maybe there was actually hunter gatherers, so I may have misspoken before, who actually have a, do not have an endowment effect, whereas we in, in market societies do, because they haven't been exposed mm. to market societies, they haven't developed it yet. So, mm. So, yeah, so I know I know I'm kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth, but I understand there's there's been some evolutionary speculation about the, you know, where the endowment effect came from, but then also recognition that some primitive societies didn't have it because it hadn't hadn't arisen yet. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. ah, cool. So so I want to come back because we're, we're, we're uh, I'm taking far more of your time than I than I promised that I would. Um, but like what's what are the what are some takeaways that you'd like people to leave at least thinking about in terms of, you know, qual life well lived based on this idea that there are there are stocks of of value which you know I guess we we also need we can't just live in flow because eventually if there's no stock there's no flow derived from it. Um, but how do how do you want people to think about this in terms of you know practical application in life? Yeah, you know, and and here I'm going to start like sounding like, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just some, you know, old Zen philosopher. I mean, really balance is the key. So, you know, on the one hand, I'm kind of advocating for, 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 for living, focusing more on the moment and focusing on flows, but you need a balance. Obviously we can't live without our capital. Our capital is very valuable to us, but I guess what I'm, what I would recommend to the reader, since probably most readers are going to be from sort of, you know, developed Western societies, you know, very, very industrialized, you know, sort of, you know, economies, right? I think that people in those economies are going to probably overemphasize the accumulation aspect, the stock aspect of life. And I'm just saying, you know, maybe that maybe the key is to move a little bit more in the direction of flows of living in the moment. Obviously, you're going to need those things that you can accumulate. And actually many things that we do in life that are stock oriented activities are extremely meaningful. Um, having and raising children is a stock oriented activity. We're building something and yet it is enormously meaningful. So, you know, I'm not saying don't be stock oriented at all. I'm saying just think about achieving a balance, thinking, think about maybe not being so obsessed with what you have and thinking more about what you do. That's so, uh, you know, just sort of thinking about people that, that are in dire situations like that, you know, don't, don't have a home, um, you know, are people who are so poor, their economic situation is so dire that they're just basically living from bill to bill. They're, they're constantly thinking about how are they going to get their bills paid? How are they going to prevent themselves from being thrown out of their, their apartment or their home? Um, and uh, I mean, there was very interesting behavioral economic research on, on specifically on, on, on how financial scarcity leads to cognitive scarcity, because mm -hmm. if you're trying desperately to make ends meet, it occupies all of your attention. And uh, I, I, I mean, this is this is one of my favorite books. It's a book called Scarcity by Molly Nathan and Shafir. And I think it's um, it just, you know, it, it was for me an eye opener about about the nature of poverty. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you yeah. know, it's we're so so many people in capitalist societies are are, you know, like to think, you know, just if they could pick themselves up by their bootstraps, you know, if they could just yeah. they work a little harder, they could better their situation. But you have no idea what it's like if you're poor and, and your mind is completely taken over by this. You can't even free up any any bandwidth to, to think about how you could possibly pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah. And what's coming to me is that. The scarcity that causes um, this kind of inequality, and you and I had a little brief conversation about inequality and whether billionaires 
are okay. When we, we, we saw each other at the reunion uh, a month and a half ago. Um, but the, like the, the scarcity mindset that, that, um, that, um, pred- you know, I'm losing words. I must be, I must be late at night. That's, that's kind of <laughs> propping up this kind of inequality doesn't come from the people without, right? It, 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 like if, if we all had these, this more altruistic um, mindsets with less endowment effect, then on a societal level, we would make sure that everyone had enough. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely agree. There are some very important societal takeaways and, and it's, um, I mean, I'm, I'm often, I'm just, I'm just often, yeah, I'm struck by how such small changes could make such a big difference. You know, I mean, there, there's, you know, I, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, I don't, I don't know if I want, you know, sort of want to preach specific policies, but, but, uh, but in some sense, the people that are, are, are struggling the most, they, they really require so little just to improve their situation. It's, it's not, you know, it's, it's not a, uh, uh, it's um, it's kind of a no brainer. I mean, we, wh- why aren't we doing some of the things that the simple things that we could do, I think, to uh, to improve people's lots? Like what? <laughs> give us, oh, give I us mean, a little policy. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Off the top of my head, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm going to now try and think about I mean, there's you know, there's great policies like Head Start that, you know, you always read that they, they were they were tremendous and, you know, just simple things that but also here like, OK, um, Obamacare, I think, helped a lot of people. I think just getting people health care, you know, as as kind of, you know, guaranteeing it. I, I mean, you think about how people's bandwidth is kind of taken up, their mental bandwidth is taken up by these concerns. Well, if you mm-hmm. if you know that you have health insurance that you can actually, if you get sick, you can be taken care of. That's something that now you don't have to worry about. And because you aren't worrying about that, you can think more about doing, working hard on your job, you know, actually doing something to earn money because you're not having to worry about this thing. That's just, it's just so simple for us to take care of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think, I think, I think Obamacare was a great, was a great thing. And, 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 um, and it's just little things like that, that we don't, you know, you think of them, some segments of Americans who think of that as sort of a handout. Well, in, 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 in some sense, it's just kind of a no brainer. It's just, well, why don't we do this for our citizens? You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, they do it in Spain. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. A number of European countries, you know, Finland. I mean, well, I don't know if Finland popped into my head, but yeah, a number of European countries. Yeah, beautiful. So when when do you think the book might be out or and if it's going to take a while? Do you have any sort of public facing anything where people can who are interested in your work can follow you or you? Yeah, you go, so, go? so I'm yeah. going to. OK, so. Uh, Gosh, I'm, 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 my, my public facing things are kind of proto public facing at this point. I mean, I'm on, uh, I'm almost ashamed to say this these days, but I am on Twitter. Um, I'm also, I also, I have a sub stack. I've started a sub stack, but I'm really not making good use of it yet. It's the kind of, I started it because I wanted to have it running when the book when, when, when we were getting to the point where I wanted to publicize the book, but it's not quite, it's a little early for that. So, but I have a sub stack, I'm on Twitter and, um, and I will be, I will be posting more on sub stack. I, I, I definitely intend to do that. Okay. Um, so I'll, I will grab the URL. I'll put it in the show notes and you know, there's people like, you know, I, I like sub stacks that get published rarely because then I <laughs> I don't have to. Oh, then you'll love mine. (laughs) 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 And I'm going to spoil it for you if I start publishing more, but no, I'm, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. It's, 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 it's out there and I'm, I'm going to use it once I can figure out what to do with it. It's like, you know, it's like one of these, once you get rolling, then, then you, then you can do it, but I haven't really started gotten past that hump yet. So. (laughs) All right. Well, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll put it there for people who want to find it. Thank you. Uh, so capital actually, um, I, I wish it a uh, an easy birth. Thank you, Howie. Mm-hmm. Fingers crossed. Yeah, well, yeah, this has been fun. I mean, this, this yeah. was a great a great flow. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. It's it's always a pleasure talking to you, Howie. And uh, this was yeah, it was a very interesting conversation for me as well. Thank you.
Cool. Well, yeah. Thank, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for all the the thoughtful work you have you have been doing, and the and and kind of it. All, it's almost like you know you you end up with these very sort of grounded spiritual truths coming from like you know from economic from a very different place. Like the, the that you know if it's true, it's true, and it should be deducible. From I don't know physics to biology to theology to history to behavioral economics to standard economics, and I think you've uh, it sounds like a contribution you've made. Kind of draw that line and say that yeah. we don't we don't have to we don't have to just stick with economics that that makes assumptions that we are selfish, auto, you know, atomized elements trying to um, you know maximize our own. Um, pleasure at the expense of others. Yeah, I think I think we can learn a lot just by, you know, observing what people do. I mean, I get I get my ideas from research just just by like what I see people do at the store or like when I'm talking to friends, I see how they behave, you know, and I'm like, hey, wait, you know, do economists have this right. If they shouldn't, then then maybe we got something, you know, we can do better. Beautiful. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's fun to be uh, to have to be willing and able to ask those kind of questions of, uh, of accepted dogma. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's one of the things I like about an academic career. So here I am, I finally come to the, <laughs> you know, my calling. Right. And, and this, this is what I love about it. Yeah. You get to ask those questions. Awesome. Well, Matt, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure and I hope we talk again soon. Yeah. Same. Okay. Take care, Howie. See ya. Bye-bye.